Welcome to Data Skeptic Machine Intelligence, our podcast series exploring contemporary topics in artificial general intelligence and large language models. One of the striking properties of large language models, actually this was there before we had large language models, even technologies like BERT, they had the property of being multimodal that is capable of solving many problems at the same time or with small amounts of nuance to each problem in training. We've continued to see progress in that way. There's been recent waves of all the different tests like the SAT and the LSAT that ChatGPT or some other large language model can now pass. And rightly so, it sends us in search of new challenges and new milestones. What are the intrinsically human things that humans do and machines simply can't or can't today? Well, how about humor? Everyone knows large language models can make a joke. You be the judge of whether or not the joke is funny. Or maybe the large language model can do that for us. I've listened to a lot of stand-up comedians on podcasts, and they often talk about how in front of a crowd their art is. A musician can be in a room alone and practice their craft and know when it's getting better. A comedian has to test theirs in front of a crowd. But could a comedian refine his or her act by performing in front of an AI crowd? Well, I don't know if we're ready for that today, but we might be soon. Today's interview explores the idea of evaluating jokes with large language models. I'm Fabricio, and I'm a lecturer at the University of Leicester. My research interest is in creativity evaluation. Actually, my background, my PhD, was in uh, high-performance computing. But at the time, I start studying AI, and I start applying AI to optimize parallel programs. And at some point, I just jump to the other side and start working more with AI and less with high-performance computing. And then I don't know, 2016, I found a conference called the International Conference on Computational Creativity. And that really grabbed my attention. And since then, I'm, I'm really curious in find ways of evaluating creativity as a whole. Yeah. I think most listeners won't have a deep familiarity with computational creativity. Could you share a few details on the sorts of things the field looks into? Computational creativity is a subfield of artificial intelligence where we try to create creative machines. So, for example, you want to create an algorithm to create jokes or an algorithm to create a story or painting or anything like that. So it's a it's a really interesting community because you have comedians, you have like artists, you have musicians and you have computer science people. And we all come together to try to do something creative. So that's it. (laughs) And to what degree have large language models been influencing the field? At the moment, it's starting to get some trust. It's, it's interesting because we, we passed so much, so many years trying to create the AI, which would do interesting stuff. And once we created it, we are like, what can we do with that? You know, so we, we are still trying to find ways of, of using large language models. Mainly now we have two sides. Let's say there is these image text to image systems where the artists, they use it, uh, visual artists. And we have the large language language models like GPT that we use more for text based things like poetry or jokes or these sorts of things. When you solve most machine learning problems, you'll have either like a strict reward system, like in reinforcement learning or a good objective function in supervised learning. And It's pretty black and white what you're trying to accomplish. Creativity, for me, isn't as obviously mathematical. How do you build systems that attempt to be creative? There are many ways. One way we do is like we observe how an artist do it. And we try to create an algorithm that follows the same steps of the artist. That's one way of doing it, which we call the creative by the process. Another thing, we try to create creative artifacts. The most simple thing you could do is like a a sentence generator, random generator, and you create some kind of random joke or random something. And we, we ask people to evaluate it to see if it's creative or not. And then we, we start building on this random generation and we try to include two concepts, which is the concepts of creativity. It has to have novelty and value. Novelty means it has to be different from the existing ones. 
and value is related to the usefulness. And usefulness here is a really broad sense. You know, for example, if you're painting, usefulness could be beautiful or aesthetic pleasing, or joke could be funny, or poetry could be interesting. And we try to find ways to measure those metrics. Usually we create these algorithms which are guided by creativity which is novelty and value. And I started like that. My first paper on that conference, I tried to propose a metric, which was called RDC, Region Dependent Creative. It's not a very good name. But what we are trying to do is uh, we are working with uh, culinary recipes and we are trying to generate new ones. So what we did, we had a database full of recipes that we know. So with that database, we could use some metric, for example, surprise by Asian surprise, which measures the difference between what you generate and the existing ones. So higher surprise means more novelty. And then we used another metric, which was a graph-based solution where we have the ingredients and we have a graph connecting all those ingredients. And there is a theory, which is a theory that says that if you have more flavor compounds shared by those ingredients, the, the food will be tastier. So we create a kind of graph and we, we evaluate the synergy between them. It's how they are connected, the density, this kind of metric uh, based on, on graphs. And then we can calculate the value and we can calculate the, the novelty. And then we start generating and then we evaluate using the same metrics we, we use to generate. That's how it works, basically. AI, the, the traditional AI, we are just focused on efficiency, just on value. We want something that's more valuable. Creativity is different. We want valuable and novel as well. So I think we add this other metric in all the algorithms in AI to try to, to move towards creativity. I like that approach, but I also wonder if it could have some rough edges. For example, if I tried to follow the process to invent my own recipe, maybe I would start with something known like an omelet and then add chocolate sauce to it. That would be a very surprising ingredient and one that contributes a lot of flavor profile, but I would not be happy with this new omelet. Yeah, it might happen, you know, but for example, you said about chocolate, you know, chocolate and pepper. They have lots of compounds together. So if you can create a chocolate pepper, you it will be tasty. So if you use this theory, for, for example, you always end up with good recipes for Western recipes because it doesn't apply to Eastern kind of, of recipes. It, it depends. So for each problem, you really need to understand the problem and find, let's say, some shortcuts to measure how, how valuable, how good, how tasty is what you're doing. Otherwise, you end up in what you said, you know. So uh, that, that's why this community is really cool because you have specialists, you know, experts like a comedian or, a, a, I don't know, other people that really understands that. And when you come with your computer science side of it, they say, okay, it works, but it's not right. So you should think about these, 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 and that. And that hel helps a lot for us to make some progress on, on this kind of research. Could you share any, uh, I don't know if it's anecdotes or just thoughts on that process? What's it like to interact with presumably non-technical creative professionals on this endeavor? Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, uh, talking about the, the culinary recipe, you know, I, I'm, I'm originally from Brazil. There I, I had a kind of a podcast as well so but not as famous as yours but i we we did one episode it was about ai and we did one episode that i i called one of my students to explain all this theory about culinary recipe we generate a system and we talk to a, a, a chef an actual chef and ask the chef to use the tool generate some recipe and then cook it and and the the, the chef actually cook it and we could taste it and he gave some feedback on how to improve the system. So it's really satisfying, you know, because you, you many times in computer science, I can say high performance computer, for example, you never see your client, you know, you never see the, the, the end point of it. 
And in creative, it's completely different. You you always talk to the, the 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 person that will use your system, which is really exciting. And what's it like to get that feedback? I don't imagine they would say, "Oh, it's you know, you regularize something wrong." They would say the food is bland, or the poetry is boring, or uh, how does uh, uh, an adjective like boring assist in your work? People usually they are very polite with their answers. For example, that chef. He said, okay, the system is kind of okay, but I need to adapt some things, most of it, you know, so, but he, he, he doesn't say that. So people, usually they, they see your enthusiasm of what you're doing and they try to give you really some hints, but usually people are polite and try to, to give you some useful feedback that you can use on, that, on those systems. There are some, people's, they, some people that they are kind of uh, skeptic, skept, skept, oh, sorry. So, skeptical about it. <laughs> It's the name of the podcast. <laughs> so uh, there are people skeptical about it. When you say, oh, I have a machine that will do it, they say, no, no way. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Even though they, they give you a chance to see it, to see it, how it works. And then afterwards, they, they are not that skeptical. They say, okay, it can do some basic things, but it will never be better than a professional. That's mostly the, the, the final feedback we get. You know, they, they don't think machines can get better than the humans, most of, of these uh, creative tasks. What's your opinion about that challenge? Yeah, it's a big challenge, right? I, I, I'm from computer science, so usually we, we, we are, our work is to try to make those machines somehow better than us at some sense, you know, or at least we try to create machines that they can do, can help us to do things better, you know. I think that's the common sense in the community. We are not really trying to make machines better than us, you know, completely. We are trying to make machines that, can help us to achieve results faster or more creative in, in some sense. Because if you really do a machine that is really better than you on anything, it's so boring, right? You, you, you don't have a job, you don't have what to work on. We are not still on that point, you know? I think there, there is much research to be done until we are discussing here that a machine will replace you in your podcast, a machine will teach in my place, so I... I think still a, a few years at least from that. Well, when I think about how I might set up some of the problems in a machine learning sort of way, you know, I can get various properties of whatever we're looking at, be it humor or, or recipe or poetry. I could find some way to do feature engineering. I might even get some features from the user themselves because, you know, a good song to one person is a bad song to another person. If I took these sort of well-trodden paths of trying to make a prediction like that, Is machine learning out of box any good at predicting what humans will like? I think they are starting to do it. You know, even if you take, let's say, the plain GPT-4, you know, you're, you're not doing any fine tuning, you're not doing anything, you're just doing prompt engineering. If you prompt it with the right input, you get some interesting result. But that's not an easy task. You know, if you just uh, write, for example, naive prompts, you just get some general random kind of thing. But GPT was trained with so much data that it has knowledge about almost anything there. You know, if you find the right words to get this information out of it, you can actually do good predictions, whatever you're doing. It's not an easy task and you don't get it with the, the, the first prompt you try. I just got a paper accepted yesterday. In that paper, what we are trying to do is we have like, there is the alternative uses test of creativity. I don't know if you heard about it. It's a test that you, for example, given an object, for example, a fork, I would like you to tell me alternative use of a fork. So you can use a fork for as a catapult for paper balls. You could use a, a, a to to hold your hair or or something like that. And then these are creativity tests that you apply to humans. You know to know how creative you are. So we did this experiment experiment with GPT-4. So we we gave some objects and asked it to create alternative uses. 
So we started with a simple prompt, a naive prompt, and that prompt gives you really not really good, not really creative uses. But then we 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 found out some some technique to make it uh, give you better results. There is an interesting thing that you can do with GPT-4 is that you could create some prompts that put pressure on GPT-4. Things like, oh, I didn't like this answer. Try your best next time. And then GPT generates something even better. And then you say, it's your last chance. If you don't get it right, you, you, you failed. And then it gives you even better. There is a point that you can't get better than, than, than the limit it can give. But after four, three, three interactions, it can actually generate a much better alternative use than the, the, the initial one, which is comparable to human ones. We are talking about how to get the, the most of GPT. You know, there are these techniques you can do, even starting with a naive prompt, you can push it so it can give you a, a better result. So that's one, one technique that I'm calling like a automatic prompt optimization, you know, because it's an automatic thing. You can type a naive prompt and automatically I'll give you a, a, an answer which is much, much better than, than the original one. So that, that's one way. But I think it's really an open field, you know. You can try many, many interesting things. That's just one example. Are you a software engineer looking to make an impact with one of the world's premier data and technology companies? Well, you should look into Bloomberg. Bloomberg is building the world's most trusted information network for financial professionals. And right now, they're looking for engineers to join them. You know, for me, there's two critical features when I would consider a new role. Impact first, job security second. Well, in terms of job security, you can look up Bloomberg and see how long they've been around but more importantly, in terms of impact, you'll be part of a team that builds and delivers tools to help the world's leading business and financial decision makers surface relevant information in an ever-changing ocean of data so that they can act quickly on it. Their software engineers build solutions that are relied on by more than 350,000 financial professionals all around the world, using them to make critical business decisions. The company is committed to building a diverse workforce full of fresh perspectives. So if you're in the market or just thinking about what your next move might be, learn more about this opportunity by visiting Bloomberg.com slash careers. That's Bloomberg.com slash careers. Thank you to today's sponsor, EOS Data Analytics, which is all about using satellite analytics solutions to drive sustainability. They're helping professionals across different industries make data-driven decisions and adopt sustainable practices. Their team unites 60 in-house data scientists, including 25 PhD professors. EOS Data Analytics is all about turning geospatial insights into tools that solve real-world business tasks while keeping sustainability at the forefront. Use the promo code EOSDA10 and start leveraging the power of advanced remote sensing data. If you're curious about EOS Data Analytics and how they can help your business, academic, or personal purpose, you should check out their website at eos.com. Well, could it be that GPT-4 in the out of you know off-the-shelf version already has achieved superhuman level ability to write poetry? It's just we're not prompting it well enough to get these amazing poems out of it. Well, I'm 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 working with a colleague from the University of Kent, and his PhD is on poetry using GPT to generate poetry. And so far, he's interested in a particular a poet. Because you have these uh, problems with copyright if you use uh, poets that are, are alive. You know? So he's using Whitman's, which is a, a very old uh, a poet. And he has a very particular structure of poems. It's very unstructured. It's, it's very different from traditional poetry. So he tried to use prompt engineering to generate poems like Whitman. And he also used fine-tuning to do it. And the result are really shows that GPT-4, plain GPT-4 off the shelf, it doesn't generate Whitman's poems really well. But if you fine tune it, it generates really good poetry that looks like Whitman. He fine tuned GPT to be a classifier to say if the poem is from Whitman or not. 
And when he do various comparisons, the ones generated by the fine tuning, they really generate good poetry of Whitman. So I would say that playing GPT, it doesn't work really well for the, most of the things you try. But for poetry specifically, you need to go for fine tuning if you want to get really good poetry out of it. Well, in terms of evaluating the poetry that comes out, or maybe to the specific paper we're going to go into detail on, evaluating the quality of a joke. Could you talk a little bit about that process? If you take uh, the field of computational creativity, most of the time we are using humans to evaluate creativity because we are like the ultimate judges on creative. There is no other creature creative that we know of. So every experiment you do, if you don't have humans validating it, you can't really say that this is creative. And jokes is, is the case, you know. I start working with jokes because there is a comedian, an American comedian. He, his name is Joe Toplin. He, he works for these light, late night shows like Jay Leno. And, and, and he's also a researcher. And then he started publishing papers about, he created theory about uh, jokes, how to create funny jokes. And then he created an algorithm to implement his theory. And he published these papers and the follow-up versions of his, his tool in the Computational Creativity Conference. And his jokes are basically, he takes like a headline news and then he creates the rest of it. And he compared the, the versions he created, the ones from GPT, the ones from his tool, and he asked people to evaluate if the joke was funny or not on a scale from one to five, for example. And then the result was GPT wasn't funny, you know, uh, and his tool creates really funny jokes as humans do. So his tool, which is not GPT, can create a better, better joke than, than playing GPT. But he's using humans to evaluate the results. What I thought was, okay, let's see if GPT is good enough to replace people, to judge uh, uh, jokes. You have two things important here, generation and evaluation. We are really good at generation. We can generate lots of things in a few seconds, in a few minutes, but we are very, very slow at evaluating because we need people. That's a big bottleneck in the field. If we could have a machine that is as good as evaluating as generating things, this would speed up a lot. And imagine you are a comedian and then before you release your joke, you have like a virtual assistant that you can tell your joke and then you get some feedback and say, okay, it's not funny. Try more like this, try more like that. Every time you release to the public a joke, you know already that it will be successful. And then you can apply this for joke, for poetry, for blog posts, whatever you're doing. You know, it's really a, a, an amazing opportunity. So I took GPT-3 and then I, I did some experiments and I said, okay, I'll ask GPT-3 to uh, evaluate those jokes. That paper, I just want to create a spark on that, just to start discussing that, uh, that, that topic. Because most of the people, when I say that I'm using GPT to evaluate, they say, no, it doesn't work. You know, you can't do that. GPT is black box solution. You don't know exactly what GPT is thinking about. You can't really trust the results of GPT, which I agree. But there is another thing, you know, for example, sometimes I ask people to evaluate jokes, but I don't know the background of those people. I don't know what they are, their preferences. I don't know what their background. And I just rely on their scores just because they're humans, you know, so I assume they can evaluate. And I said, okay, GPT has its own preferences, has its own intrinsic metrics that it uses. Why not? I, I'm not saying that GPT is, is human. You know, I'm not saying GPT do exactly as human do it, but GPT has its own way of evaluating things. And that might be useful to us. Why not use it and try to speed up that process? So I tried to compare. I basically took all the, the jokes from Toplin's paper. 
I asked GPT to score them and also to explain why I asked just to see if the explanations make sense. And then I compare the, the rating of GPT with the rating of the users, the, the humans, evaluators. To be honest, in that paper, I don't have like a really strong correlation, you know, but you see that there is something there, you know, it's like the, the first step. So I just want to publish that paper to really engage people into discussing this idea. And the most interesting thing on top of that, the idea of creating a virtual crowd. Instead of having one kind of GPT, GPT has this ability of, uh, you can describe the system description or the style or the persona or personality, depending on the, what people like to do. People are very sensible to these words, you know. Sometimes when you say personality, they say, no, this is not personality. This is a machine. We can't say that. But people, some people prefer style or system description. But the fact is, you can configure GPT to have some kind of background. I created uh, four different uh, configuration, uh, configurations of GPT because I, I found a paper in psychology saying that there are four types of humor. I configure with these four types of, uh, of humor and said, OK, let's see if it evaluates differently depending on the, the humor. And what I found out that was interesting, most of Toplin's jokes, they are more in the spectrum of more uh, adult kind of joke because you have like children joke, which is called more like affiliative humor. And you have more adult kind of joke, which is on the self-defeating, aggressive side of it. So... When I configure GPT with the aggressive and self-defeating spec, which is closer to the, 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 the nature of, of Toplin's jokes, it found more jokes funny in that database than the affiliative, which would be the kids' version, which found less jokes funny. It could be for different reasons. The only, uh, maybe just in the description, I wrote aggressive or self-defeating, and then it found something related to that. And then it gave more score for, for this. And children, at some, at some point, I, I might have included some words that it couldn't find in the, in the joke. You know, we don't know exactly how GPT did it, you know, and that's the big issue in the, in the field, really. Try to extract what GPT thinks about. That's what we did in this in this paper. So in that case, do you generate all the jokes or is there some corpus of jokes you can use? I'm a very bad comedian, you know, and when it comes to jokes in English, it's even worse. You know, it's not my native language. Sometimes I don't understand them. So it would be really nice to have a virtual system that could say, OK, now we should laugh, <laughs> you know, and then I laugh. <laughs> so but I use Toplin's uh, jokes, you know, he had this uh, data set of jokes. So I used from his paper, but I wrote an, uh, a follow up paper that is going to be published on that conference I mentioned because I used GPT-3 for that experiment. Then I, I did more experiments to use GPT-4 and using a larger data set. If you take uh, Toplin's uh, jokes, he has like t uh, dozens, uh, dozens of, of, of jokes. If you take this new data set I'm using, you have thousands of jokes. I repeated the, the experiment, but now instead of comparing the rating directly, score by score, what I'm doing is, for example, I have like a thousand jokes. Then I sample five of them, and then I use the human scores to rank it, and then I use the machine to rank it. And then I use a, a correlation, the Spearman's correlation, so I can compare if they are they have a positive correlation, which means they are ranking the same way. And then I did this experiment over and over many times with the same personas I created on the, the previous one with different types of humor. And I also created a new persona, which is, it's, I, I tried some kind of reverse engineering. I gave to GPT examples on how people rate jokes. And then I said to GPT to generate the prompt 
to configure a person that would have this kind of rating. And for my surprise, when I used that configuration, the correlation is the most positive I got. I'm not giving the examples. You know, it's different from fine-tuning because uh, there is this different of prompting, which you have zero-shot prompting, where you don't give examples to GPT. I just say, uh, rate this joke from one to five. There is few shot prompting where you give some examples. I say, okay, joke one, score three, joke two, score one, and so on. And then I ask it to generate. Now with GPT-4, because you can have longer prompts, you have many shot prompting where you get lots of examples. And then you have fine tuning where, where you train the model with those uh, things, which it's, it's much more expensive to do. But if you give too many examples, like 100 examples, and you have many shots, it's also expensive. Because for every new inference you do, you have to give all the examples again and again and again, which makes it more expensive. This technique I, I proposed, it's like a way of summarizing this uh, many shot prompting, create a persona, which will substitute the many shot prompting, and then you can use it. And then I found a, a positive correlation between that persona and the people, humans, how humans evaluate it. Really, I, I think that's the strongest result so far I, I, I found about that indicates that we could actually use GPT-4 to evaluate jokes. Not the final result, but there is some good indication that might maybe GPT-5 or if we could improve how to create that persona, you know. It's all about trying to extract the right persona, the right, the right way of asking GPT. But there, there is definitely something there. Well, I wonder about where things go next. You've mentioned a couple of directions, like maybe it's GPT-5 will be influential, but you've also talked about how fine-tuning has some improvements. Where should uh, researchers like yourself be most fruitful in spending their energy? I'm particularly interested in generative agents. It's not just one GPT. I would like to have many GPT talking to each other trying to solve a problem. Because imagine when we are brainstorming, we humans, when you're brainstorming to have new ideas, we always come up with better ideas when we, we, sure. we discuss to each other. For example, th there is a company, a startup called uh, Chirper.ai. They created an AI social network. It's a Twitter with bots. Humans are not allowed. <laughs> and then you can create your bot. You give the description of the persona of your bot, and they generate the background, they generate the image, and then the bots start posting things. Posting, uh, for example, I create one joker, a joke uh, comedian, and then the bots start creating uh, jokes and giving likes, dislikes, commenting. You know, they talk to each other. I'm trying to work with these guys. Uh, we have some meetings. We're we still uh, setting up what we are going to do. But basically, my next step is to create, a, you know, the big five personality trait test, which is this personality test that people do. There is one paper that the guys did that test with a GPT-4. There are five types of traits. And you have 32 combinations of these uh, traits. What these guys did, they configured GPT with, uh, let's say, personality one, and then asked GPT to answer the test. And by the end of the test, GPT was classified as personality one. And they did this, this for all the 32 personalities. This is really interesting because now we could create a bunch of people with different personalities, put them in different scenarios to solve different problems. For example, how to create an alternative use of, of an object or how to create a joke or how to create poetry and see if they together can create more interesting, more creative things. And the same way we could use those personalities so we could create a crowd to evaluate so if I create a joke, I know exactly what kind of personality will like this kind of joke. 
And depending on the, the audience I have, I have a predominant kind of, of personality. And that might be interesting. It's not just personality, the, the personal preferences as well. But the, the interesting thing about using the big five, for example, is that you can cover the whole space of different kinds of people. And then you can create all these kinds of, of interactions and, and, and try to see how, how they behave behave so that that's what i'm looking into for for the next uh, steps when and, and maybe the answer is right now but i'll ask it as when when do you think crowd score will be ready to help a comedian improve their act if you are someone that likes to try out new stuff you know i think we have a a prototype you can use it at least discard the worst jokes Probably it won't tell you this is the best joke by far, but it will probably tell you this is not a good joke. And there is a lot of room for improvement, but I think we, we are in this first, first step of the, this long uh, stare. <laughs> well, if the system continues to improve, we could imagine a day where today a comedian has to get up in front of a crowd of people and perform to try out their jokes. So they have, you know, a limited number of events per day, even if they work every day. If they could get up in front of their webcam and perform for agents, they might be able to iterate faster, achieve humor more quickly. Do you believe in that model? Will there be this sort of uh, like much like GANs do with the uh, generator and discriminator that we can find a way to really start uh, outputting lots of jokes in the near future? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think not just for jokes, but we are going to have these virtual assistant for all the tasks we do. And we are always getting feedback. For example, in universities, we teach as well, and we have lots of teacher assistants. Now we have another layer of teacher assistants, which are uh, the GPTs and, and other kinds of large language models. So I think we will have this kind of tutor, this kind of coach helping you, your buddy helping you on everything you do, really. <laughs> Do you think um, there'll be some sort of ceiling that you hit, uh, pro uh, presuming we don't invent an artificial general intelligence, mm -hmm. in which case, by definition, right, it can be as good a comedian as a human, mm -hmm. without achieving AGI, to what degree can computational tools help in the creative process? Yeah, I think, uh, of course, if we reach AGI, it, it's a problem, because if we reach AGI, the machine will probably get better than us. Sure. And then it won't be helpful. It will give you the solution straight away. Independently of creating AGI or not, we need to create agents that are helpful to us. It's much more interesting to have an agent that knows in which level you are now and how to be useful to you than have a super intelligent agent that you don't even understand it. I think this, independent of reaching AGI or not, I think that's not the goal here. The goal is really to find that uh, agent that helps you on the level you are right now to move to the next level. I think that's the, the important thing. Well, the dream of these large language models is that everything is just prompting or you know maybe a little bit of fine tuning, that it's just kind of magic out of the box. Do you think that's appropriate for creative endeavors or are they special in some way where they need... Uh, much like you were describing earlier of the person who built their own generative system uh, for comedy and it was outperforming GPT out of the box. Does creativity need to bring its own auxiliary toolbox? You know, I don't think LLMs are the final solution for everything. People will always have other ways of getting uh, information. You know, there, there is a, a big limitation for LLMs at the moment. It doesn't interact with the environment. They are not multi-model at the moment, which means they just understand text. Some versions will understand text and, and image and at some point sound and other things, you know. Until we have an LLM that has the same capacities that we have, you know, the same senses that we have, they are locked inside the box. So they cannot uh, outperform us, you know, they cannot really do their, their best. That's the point, you know, at the moment, for example, if you are a musician, I'm, a, I'm not a professional musician, but I, I, I play the, the guitar. And for example, I use GPT to give me some lyrics 
to give him some notes, you know, I, 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 other day I asked him to create a punk rock song about a guy that doesn't like to work. And it was kind of funny, you know, I changed some lyrics, I, I changed some notes, but I ate, you know, I, I want to play. I don't want it to play for me, you know, so it helped me in the creative process, but it didn't do all the job. If it does all the job, it's it's not funny, you know, and I want to use my influences, my personal uh, experience to do it. So and people want to use their tools as well, you know, the the way they do things, you know. So, yeah. Do you have a vision for what creativity looks like in the future? Like, as you'd mentioned, we're, you probably don't want a system that just kicks out a song for you to play. But if you have a tool that assists you uh, or guides you or tutors you along the way, that's that's something a little different. What will creative endeavors that are technology assisted look like as these uh, systems like LLMs continue to develop? Yeah, I think, for example, I have these, uh, I've always watched uh, Star Trek, you know, and now I think we are living Star Trek somehow. Think about Alexa. I would like to compose a song just talking to Alexa to say, for example, oh, create a rhythm like this. Now add some kind of lyrics about this kind of topic. Now add a drum, faster, slower. I'd like to have this kind of interaction and building things. I think that's where we are moving to. There is another direction, which is only AI stuff. You know, it's like this AI social network. We are going to have music generated only by AIs. And somehow we'll be competing with them. There is music which is co-creativity, you and the machine do it together. You don't have to do too much of the hard work anymore. You know, it does for you. You just use more your decision making to do things. I like this, I don't like this. I like this, I don't like this. And then when it creates, you feel that it's yours because it was based on your decisions. But on the other hand, we have just AI stuff. There are people that will say, okay, I, I only like AI music. I don't like music from people, you know, or the other way around, you know. I think we will end up in these kinds of things. But I, I think there is space for both of them. You know, I, I don't think there is just AI or just people doing. I think it's a, it's a combination of it. Well, good vision for sure. <laughs> well, Fabricio, where can listeners follow you online? On LinkedIn. I, if they want to go to my profile, it's, uh, or, or the university, if they go to the university website, I have a uh, university of Leicester, Fabricio Goes, I'm there. My email is there. It's the best way to get in touch. My email, fabricio.goes at, uh, leicester.ac.uk. Excellent. Well, I'll have links in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on and share your work. Thanks a lot. Well, that concludes this installment of Data Skeptic Machine Intelligence. Join us again next time when we explore how AI is affecting mathematics education.